being real. It means that they may be heavy for you. Uh, so we may be discussing physical, well, we will be discussing and, and maybe discussing in more detail, um, physical and emotional abuse, incarceration and detainment, gun violence, police brutality, and death. Um, so I recognize that all of you come from very different backgrounds. I wish that I could know how this affects you personally, but I just encourage you uh, to do what you need to, to monitor yourself in this space. If you need to take a step back, if you need to turn your camera off or take a step away, do some stretches, um, whatever you need, just moderate yourself as much as you, as much as you need during our time together today. I want to open with a group agreement so we're all just on the same page and we can facilitate good conversation together. First thing, we want to read one another charitably, and that just means we want to assume the best. Uh, whenever someone's speaking, we want to assume that they may be speaking about from personal experience or something they know something about. We want to assume the best about each other and listen well, um, really try to listen to what one another are saying. I want to encourage you to participate, um, give as much of yourself as you're capable of. Um, and then the inverse of that is that you also have the right to pass. So if I ask a question and you don't feel comfortable answering yet, you don't need to you don't need to participate. You always have that right to pass. But if you have thoughts or feelings, opinions, we would love to hear them. Next, we want to commit to respect and diversity. Again, we've got all different people in this group, and we don't know each other um, as well as we could. And we recognize, I believe, that the opinions that we have are actually stronger because of our diversity. These are good things. So we want to make sure that we respect one another and the backgrounds that we may be coming from. Along with that, we want to suspend judgment and avoid assumptions. Um, this goes back to that reading one another charitably. Just if you if you hear somebody saying something that may not be quite what they're saying, um, the next kind of part of this is no put downs, um, using I statements. So somebody may say something that you disagree with, and that's OK. That's good. It can actually spark really generative thoughts. Um, but we want to talk about our own experiences. So rather than saying, oh, you said this and, and you said that, um, say, I feel this or I think this, and that'll help keep things a little bit more respectable, a little create space for everybody to participate. So I see some four hearts. It seems like it's good. If there's any questions about any of these, you can hit that question mark button too. Feel free to use those reaction buttons throughout the presentation as they work for you. Great. I think we got six hearts. You've got four ways that you can participate in conversation. The first, and in my opinion, the best is to come off mute. Let us hear your voice. Um, if you have something to say, you can just say it directly to us. Um, the other ones that you've got are you can write and chat publicly. There's a box where you can make sure that it says everyone and then we'll all be able to see what you say. The next one that's public and anonymous is participating right here in Mentimeter. If you're logged in, you're using those reactions, you'll be able to type any thoughts you might have. Um, but that's only for select questions, so that's a way. And the last way, which is private and anonymous, would be you can write and chat either directly to me or to Emma. Um, and actually, I think because I'm screen sharing, I'm going to default it to Emma. And then Emma will just read what your contribution is, but it won't have your name attached to it. So those are the four ways you've got of participating in our conversation. I do want to remind you that this event is being recorded for later posting. Um, I believe you've signed video releases, but just making sure that you know that. We're not live right now, but we will be later. And I want to um, just take a second to say that I'm speaking to you all personally this afternoon. So I do work for Planned Parenthood. I'm really proud to work for Planned Parenthood here with some of my team. But tonight, I just want to be discussing this book with you as an individual. So my opinions or views may or may not reflect the views of my organization. Um, we're just here to talk about the book. So I want to encourage you all to take care of yourself to the best of your ability, but share bravely when you feel comfortable. And we are here to learn from ourselves, or from the text, from ourselves and from one another. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of what this what this means to us as we go on. But we're going to do this by listening to the text, by listening to ourselves, and by listening to one another. And if we're not doing all of those kind of in equal measure, um, then it can be difficult to have to have really honest conversation. So, so I want to encourage you to take a moment to just settle in and kind of set your intentions for this time. Um, I know most of you have your camera off and that's okay. You can have your camera on or off, whichever makes you most comfortable. Um, camera on means we can see your face and have a little bit more engagement. Camera off means you have some anonymity and some space to feel what you need. I encourage you to get physically comfortable. Um, go to a space where you feel comfortable with the people around you, where you have some privacy maybe, um, as well as get physically comfortable. That'll affect the quality of attention that you have. Um, maybe take some deep breaths um, and kind of ground yourself in your body. Think about, you know, we're starting a new week here together. It's Monday. Um, think about where you are and what you're bringing. 
You can keep your eyes open or closed for this first um, piece. I'm going to just be reading some quotes from the text and then holding some space to respond. So whether you finish the text or not, doesn't really matter. Um, I hope and believe that you'll be able to respond still with any thoughts that you have. Um, and then remember your body. If you need to get up and stretch or run to the restroom or whatever, we are bodies as well as, as, well as minds. I know it's hard to remember when we're behind these screens all the time, but um, so just do what you need to take care of yourself in this space. This space is for you and this space is for us. So we'll just be talking through some themes, um, some possible ideas that surface in the text. And we'll start with some negative ones and then we'll turn to some that are maybe a little bit more hopeful, um, maybe more positive. But the first of these is detention. So when Fabiola first arrives in America with her mom, she is separated from her mother who is seized and then detained by US immigration officers. And she describes the experience in this way. She says, too much has happened for me to cry now. On the flight to Detroit, I am alone. I look down at America, its vastness resembling a huge mountain. I felt as if I was just a pebble in the valley. We leave the airport. It feels like I'm leaving a part of me behind, a leg, an arm, my whole heart. Another theme or idea that comes up is homelessness. As Fabiola struggles to make a home for herself in Detroit, she's often comparing the things she experiences to the memories that she has of her home in Haiti. And she's also moved by observing a homeless person called Bad Leg, who she later identifies as Papa Legba, someone who assists her in navigating the crossroads of American Street and Joy Road. When wrestling with these feelings of homelessness, she remarks, suddenly I feel so alone in this house. I'm surrounded by family, but none of them really knows me or understands what happened to me today. Nothing here is alive with color like in Haiti. The sun hides behind a concrete sky. I search the landscape for yellows, oranges, pinks, or turquoises, like in my beloved Port-au-Prince, but God has painted this place gray and brown. She also encounters abuse. Um, she witnesses several kinds of abuse in her adjustment to life in Detroit. Her cousin, Donna, is both physically and emotionally abused by her boyfriend, Dre. And Fabiola also witnesses the people around her abusing themselves with the use of drugs, alcohol, money, and other substances as they cope with the difficulties of their circumstances. She remarks when observing this, I don't know what to say. Don't know how to tell her not to go with him, to break it off for good so she can be free. And maybe for a moment, I hope that Dre means it this time, that he's really sorry and he loves her and he won't hurt her anymore. There's nothing else to do but hold on to that hope. But I know it's a lie that I'm telling myself. It's a lie that Donna is telling herself too. She also encounters brutality. She's introduced to Donna's partner, Dre, by watching him punch and kick bad leg, this homeless person on the street corner. And by the end of the novel, she also loses her partner, Kasim, as he is murdered by the police at a party. Here a quote we have, the red is so hot it numbs me. Maybe I'm fighting the wind, this place called Detroit, my cousins and their walls, the prison that keeps my mother, my broken home country floating in the middle of a sinking sea. Then the red hot wraps its fiery hands around my throat and I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Everything is spinning and moving so fast that it makes me sick to my stomach. When I hear those words that Kasim has been shot by the police, I become undone. So I scream and cry and hold my belly as if I'm giving birth to all the misery and pain that has ever walked the earth. Kasim is the earthquake and he has shattered my heart into a million pieces. And the last of these more negative or heavy themes that we're looking at is oppression. So Fabiola struggles to make sense of the gap between what her hopeful expectations of Detroit were and the harsh realities of the city that she encounters. She and all the people she loves are caught in systems of oppression, racism, poverty, loan sharking, abuses of power, and separation from family and from self. She describes, my cousins are hurting, my aunt is hurting, my mother is hurting, and there is no one here to help. How is this the good life when even the air in this place threatens to wrap its fingers around my throat? In Haiti, with all its problems, there was always a friend or a neighbor to share in the misery. And then after our troubles were tallied up like those points at the basketball game, we could celebrate being alive. But here, 
There isn't even a slice of happiness big enough to fill up all these empty houses and broken buildings and wide roads that lead to nowhere and everywhere. Every bit of laughter, every joyous moment is swallowed up by a deep, deep sadness. This is what happens to Ma Jo, who is back in her dark room again. This is what happens to Chantal when she studies so hard and she still has to find ways to pay for school. This is what happens to Donna, who doesn't seem to know the difference between love and hurt. And Pri just fights the choking air. She fights everything. But here we turn to some other experiences that she has in her time. Um, amidst coping with the more difficult aspects of her life in Detroit, Fabiola also discovers certain freedoms in her new community. She observes and experiments with a wider range of self-expression. She makes a new friend and a boyfriend, and she benefits from having a flow of money in her family. In reference to the money, she says, it's the most money I've had to myself. It makes me walk taller and speak with more confidence. This unearned cash makes me feel a little bit more American. This is the beginning of the good life, I think. Similarly, in spite of the pain that she lives through, Fabiola finds a way to integrate her identity as a Haitian with her identity in Detroit. She holds tight to her cultural values of voodoo and her passion to provide by making food for her friends and family, while also finding a way to survive and thrive within the range of freedom that she finds in Detroit. She describes this by saying, Creole and Haiti stick to my insides like glue. It's my bones and muscles, but America is my skin, my eyes, and my breath. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I think I'm reading a slightly different quote. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> my apologies. Um, my eyes and my breath. I borrow more of Donna's clothes now. This is how we've become closer. I give in to all the things I've always liked. Jeans that show off my curves, light makeup, not too much, just lip gloss and mascara and beautiful hairstyles that highlight my eyes and cheekbones, as Donna says. My mother is not here to judge me, so I experiment with different looks. Then as she comes to better understand her cousins and her aunt, she also comes to trust and rely on them more. The relationship is different than she remembers as it was as a child, and it isn't what she imagined for her life in Detroit, but she still recognizes the way they strengthen and support one another through life's difficulties. She also recognizes the support given to her through Voodoo and her mother, even though she is alone in holding tight to them. She remarks, I understand. They are the three Bs. They not only have to protect their bodies, but they have to protect their name and their story. And if they are my cousins, my family, I have to help protect them too. But I have to do the same for my friends too, like Imani. And remarking on her cultural heritage, she says, this is not the Voodoo you see in movies. This is the stuff my mother practiced back in Haiti. She is a mambo, a priestess. This is how we pray. We see the magic in everything, in all people. And this bad leg has been singing songs and no one listens to him. I listen. And the more I listen, the more they make sense. Beyond the support of her family, Fabiola falls in love in Detroit. And even though she loses her partner to violence, she connects with a strong, centered, and intimate part of herself through their relationship, and she discovers the power of mutual care and understanding. Reflecting on this, she says, and then I am the color pink. If hot red is for anger and rage, then pink is the color of a soft burning, hot enough to light up the dark corners of sadness and grief, but cool enough to be tender, innocent, open. I let myself sink into Kasim as he pulls me towards his bed. He is soft and gentle. I am like syrup again. And all the walls around me, everything that has blocked my joy these past few months, oozes, trickles, and melts away. And after he dies, she reflects that his ghost is a giant. And it's as if every part of him has been spread all over Detroit and lives in the air, in the water, and in other people's thoughts. His arms and legs reach farther than he ever would if he was still alive. Through all of this, she finds a sense of autonomy. There are many things that Fabiola cannot control in her life. All of these weigh heavily on her, but she is never crushed. Over the course of the novel, we witness Fabiola finding her strength, retaining her commitments to herself, to her mother, to her education, and to her family. She says, but then I realize that everyone is climbing their own mountain here in America. They are tall and mighty, and they live in the hearts and everyday lives of the people. 
And I am not a pebble in the valley. I am a mountain. So we have this theme of quality of life and whether you finished the book or are just coming to it for this first time, um, I'd like to hold some space for you to reflect on how would you describe the quality of Fabiola's life? We've looked at many themes and identities and here you can respond to something that we did discuss or something else that has stood out to you in the text. Um, and again, you've got those four means of participation. You can come off mute or you can drop something in the chat or you can type your answers right here in Mentimeter and they'll come up on the screen for all of us. But how would you describe the quality of Fabiola's life? Um, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Who is this? Oh, it's, uh, it's Anmin, hi. Anmin, great, yeah. Um, so I haven't read through that much, but it looks like she probably loses a lot. Like, mm -hmm. loses family and maybe also, I don't know how old she is in the book, but maybe whatever sort of innocence she had, but it looks like she gains a lot of, you know, freedom and maybe more time for her identity through it, which sounds fun. Yeah, absolutely, Min. thank you. And I'm sorry if I did give any spoilers, I meant to offer that as well. Um, but I really believe um, in general for text that if a text is powerful, um, then knowing the plot points doesn't necessarily impact the experience. Sometimes it can actually make it richer because Min, I think you're right on. Um, especially in describing this loss, there is profound loss in her life that is very, very real. Um, I see here also, it's real. Um, there's a great amount of loss. These things weigh deeply heavy on her, break her heart, loses her innocence. Um, but there's also this immense gain. She finds herself. She finds a new way to be in relationship to herself. Um, yeah, here I have people might think teenagers don't know anything and need to be told what to do all the time. But she is going through a lot and finding her way with her cousins and is doing her best and protecting her faith and family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would, that seems like an accurate representation to me as well. When I read the text, there's this multifaceted person. Um, and to, to say, to exclusively say that she's experiencing loss would not be to capture the spirit or the quality of her life. And to simply say that everything is totally fine and that she's completely okay. And it's fine that she experienced this loss because she became stronger as a result of it um, would also be a, a misstatement. Um, there's this real sense of tension that I hear you all describing that, that I definitely hear as well. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Um, this is Ruthie. I would say I, what I find most interesting is how, um, you know, she misses her mom and she definitely wishes that her mom could be there with her, but she kind of also knows that like, she wouldn't be able to navigate if her mom were there, you know, she wouldn't be able to wear the clothes she wants experiment with her look, go out to some of the places that, you know, her cousins go out with her with or like hang out with Kasim. So like she kind of knows like if mom was here, I wouldn't be getting like this real experience. Um, mm. But she's still like, she's like, you know, but I still miss her. I still want her here. So um, even though her mom can't be there with her, it also gave her like some sort of freedom to figure out what being American was for her. Mm. Yeah, I really agree with that. There's a quote somewhere in the book. Um, where she, where she muses on this, she has a moment where she's kind of praying or speaking or thinking to her mom and um, reflects on maybe you wanted it this way so I could find myself. Um, maybe, maybe I wouldn't have gone through this same kind of transformation if you were right here. Um, and I think that's, yeah, certainly a real process of young adulthood. But then thankfully, you know, we, we do have a reunion. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not totalizing. So she both finds herself without completely losing her mom or completely losing her family. But that tension that I hear you describing, Ruthie, yeah, is similarly, I think, very real. Um, we also have, she went through hard stages and loss and she thinks she doesn't have a purpose in life, but in the end, she is discovering she does because she is losing a lot. Um, yeah, there's a sense in which she discovers the joy and, and a sense of gratitude for the things that she does have in spite of the things that she loses. So yeah, thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, I really, I think these are, are good and very empathetic readings of the text. From this, we might conclude that binary categories um, are not sufficient to describe quality of life. When we're talking about quality of life, it doesn't make sense to just say that someone's quality of life is happy or sad, or that it's good or bad, or that they are powerful or powerless. Um, 
these are these become easy ways that we want to complete that we want to put people in boxes. Um, but there are moments of profound happiness and profound sadness, profoundly good things that happen to her and profoundly bad ones. And there are moments where she is remarkably powerful, finding herself and shaping her community. And then there are other moments where she's really powerless in the face of some of these forces that are insurmountable to just her. So we exist at and as intersections. If you have gotten into the book, then you know that Papa Legba calls at this intersection of American Street and Joy Road. Um, and we can sense that these things are both true. We are multifaceted. Um, we hold the intersections of history, of family, of our heritage, of ourself. And so in order to empathize with one another, um, this is one of the amazing things about reading is the ability to really step inside someone else's mind. In this case, it's Fabiola, who is maybe a fictitious person, but the spirit behind it of E.B. Zoboy is right there. Um, and because we spend time and attention and a couple hundred pages with Fabiola, then we get to know her in more nuanced ways. In order to have this kind of empathy for one another, it requires openness. Um, it requires understanding a perspective that is not your own understanding that other people are experiencing things that are not yours that you don't know. It also requires education because it requires contextual awareness of what someone is experiencing. If we don't understand the factors, those intersections that contribute to a person becoming who they are, then we can't really understand that person very well. And another thing that empathy requires is humility. We have to recognize that this is always an imperfect and incomplete process. We may desire to understand one another in rich and textural and multifaceted kind of ways, but we are always trapped in the perspectives of our own mind. And even as we listen, we are always filtering the things that we're hearing through our own perspectives. So it's important that we hold a sense of humility, that we recognize the imperfection and the incompleteness of this process. So we might summarize this by saying that empathy requires listening, learning, and letting go of preconceptions. Um, so there's those there's that listening component and then learning educating yourself and constantly letting go of preconceptions so now we'll kind of turn to an open question that will kind of center some of our conversation as we move forward which is what if fabiola had moved to syracuse to our city here we're talking about her quality of life and now we'll talk about our history um, so i'm going to be offering a brief and incomplete history of syracuse so everything that I'm sharing with you is true, is factually correct, but is not the whole story. There, we never have the whole story. Um, no matter how much history we study, no matter how much we read, there's always more we don't know. That's that humility piece. But this um, will give you a brief snapshot of some of the factors that weigh on Fabiola's life that are also present here in our city. So first, I want to recognize that we are indebted to the Onondaga Nation. Um, we are not only living and having this conversation on stolen ancestral lands of the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, but we are also standing on the shoulders of indigenous environmental knowledge and wisdom. And we cannot even see all of the ways in which the Onondaga Nation has shaped our hearts and our minds and the quality of our lives. Um, we, we can't even see it, um, it's, but it is a part of our intersection nonetheless. So then the first concrete event that I want to talk to you all about is redlining, which occurred from 1934 to 1968. So in 1934, the Federal Housing Administration, this being a federal or a national governing body, was formed in an attempt to recover from the Great Depression, the economic setback of the Great Depression. And cities across the nation assessed mortgage loan risk via what they called residential security maps. So residential neighborhoods, meaning places where residents were, um, places with houses, were coded, were color coded, and they were ranked from A to D. So neighborhoods which were ranked A were coded with the color green and were given 100% mortgage loan backing, meaning people could easily access owning their homes in those areas. While residents in D coded neighborhoods were coded with the color red and were given 0% mortgage loan backing, meaning they were not given mortgages by the federal government, even if they were financially established and with good credit. So whether or not you were able to access a home depended on the neighborhood that you lived in more than your own independent, independent financial status. And race played a very central role in determining um, a neighborhood's ranking. So a black individual or family moving into a neighborhood would actually immediately lower its ranking. So even if it was a higher ranking, as soon as a black individual or family moved in, the ranking would lower and this really entrenched racial segregation. So as black folks moved to Syracuse from the South, as well as from all over the world, 
Um, as a result of redlining, 93% of the city's black population was confined to a single red coated neighborhood called the Old 15th Ward. And this neighborhood is often described as a vibrant, semi thriving working class neighborhood. The Old 15th Ward was a neighborhood with housing in need of repair and where the rent was inflated 20 to 40%. So individuals here were paying 20 to 40% more for their rent, even though the housing was certainly under code. Um, but the environment also created a tight knit community with black owned businesses and social clubs. And this provided a much needed escape from, from prevalent racism. Um, and then the next thing that we're going to discuss or that, we're, that I'm offering you by way of history of our city is urban renewal, which occurred between the 1950s and 60s. So in the midst of this redlining, Congress then passed the 1949 Federal Housing Act, which promoted urban renewal projects. And so the initial idea behind this urban renewal was to replace slum areas or areas of poverty with better housing. But the consequence of this was that 75% of the 15th Ward, where 93% of the black population was living, was raised. And that means completely destroyed. And this was to make room for downtown Syracuse, um, and commercial or business interests. And then following urban renewal projects, the original 81 viaduct, the highway that exists that separates the university area from the west side of Syracuse, um, the Federal Highway Act of 1956 sought to make travel and commuting more convenient and efficient, but the 15th Ward was targeted for its proximity to downtown businesses. So a remaining 103 acres was targeted and raised. The amount that was still there was then again destroyed. And black residents were then displaced to the south side, which spurred middle and upper class white flight. This is something that is also talked about um, in American Street, white flight as a result of black families moving south, then white people moved farther north, which once again reinforced social and economic segregation in our city. So if we look at the 1937 Syracuse redlining map, we can see the difference between the neighborhoods. Here's those red ones we were talking about with 0% mortgage backing and the green ones. And if we zoom in a little closer right here, kind of in this area that looks like a boot right here by the university was where the 15th ward was located, the old 15th ward. And then if we were to look at the 2017 census data, so just a couple years ago, 80 years after redlining, um, this shows the average household income by neighborhoods. So the dark blue is an income of $10,000 to about that 17,685, so 10 to $20,000 of an average household income versus the cream areas, these lighter areas, are $54,000 to $80,000. So we can see not only the disparity between the amount of income for these households, um, and it does go lighter or darker to lighter in terms of what that is. And if we map these onto one another, um, then we can see that the areas in our city which are often struggling from poverty um, are actually a very direct consequence of these of redlining practices which were put in place 80 years ago. And you may have heard a lot about um, racial or economic segregation in Syracuse as well. Um, we do have the highest concentration of poverty of Black and Latinx folks in the nation. And this map helps picture that for you. Um, so the green dots are places where Black individuals, Black alone individuals are, and the blue are where white people live alone. And then the couple purple dots that you see are Native American, the red are Asian individuals, the yellow are Latinx and Hispanic, and right down here this mixed race is gray. And you can see there's not very much gray. Um, so this redlining map, um, it, it worked. Um, the city is segregated um, and that is kind of where we are. So that concludes this moment. I now wanna leave some space um, for what are your thoughts, feelings, or reactions to this? And you can respond in the same way. You can come off mute or drop it in the chat and you can share whether this is totally new to you, if you knew some of this before, um, something more personal, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Then why is everyone surprised about racism? That's a really good question. Um, that's a really heavy question. I am not going to attempt to answer it authoritatively. I believe that's something that we can only answer as a community, as a collective, not just as a city, but as a nation, as a world. Um, my best sense that what, I, what, what speaks to me about this question um, is that I think that we tend to talk about racism as very personal kind of things. You know, we're reading a text and we're engaging very personally with it. 
people tend to talk about, oh, well, is this person racist or is this thing racist or was this comment racist? And it's not that those things don't have merit, that it's not very worthwhile to consider our own personal ideologies, but to recognize that, yeah, the surprise is a good word for it, that we can see that racism is at least as much structural and di dictated by legislation, by policy, by collective kind of actions, by city infrastructure things. Um, and so, yeah, there's a sense in which that's very impersonal. We were not, none of us were alive in 1937 making these redlining maps, um, but we still very much are affected by them today. Um, thank you for making this info more accessible. I would like to share this with my family. That is so rich. Um, yeah, you are most welcome. I am sharing this with my family, with my community. Um, I really believe that there's a sense in which in understanding these things, not only can we understand our own history more, um, but we can, we can recognize, again, the kind of impersonality of these things. I think people tend to blame themselves sometimes for, for being poor, for being disenfranchised, for not being integrated into a community. And by recognizing and, and engaging with this history, we can see um, the ways in which these things are larger than just some individuals. Um, we also got a comment in the chat. Thank you, um, I always knew about the segregation of Syracuse, but I didn't know that it was a product of redlining. And just to bounce off of that, um, the idea of having the visuals, I think, is really important um, because we oftentimes see it in our neighborhoods, but seeing it on a map, I think, makes it like factual in a way. I, I don't know if the right words are coming to me right now, but it's very stark to see mm. on a map. Yeah, I definitely agree. And thank you for reading that comment. And um, thank you for that contribution. Um, yeah, I, I certainly agree. Visualization of information. We live in an information age. We all take in so much information every day. Um, but visualizing it, I think, can help connect it, can help make it more tangible. Um, the book makes it seem like immigrants are less than everyone else. But what immigrants go through is different than racism because it's that and starting over. It's good for people to see immigrant or Black or Latinx uh, or Latino. Um, we are all being left out. Absolutely. So I think what this speaks to me is, is a sense of coalition, a sense of commonality. I think I absolutely, I, I certainly agree. And I hope that you don't hear me to be saying that the history of, of Black people, of Latinx people, of, of any people is all the same. Again, in terms of the multifaceted nature of these things, um, there's a sense in which we are all deeply collective and deeply individual. That's one of those intersections. And there are definitely challenges of the immigrant experience that compound these things. Being first generation um, into a new place um, can be really, really difficult. Um, and yet that doesn't change the fact that, you know, Fabiola is a black person. And so the ways in which she would experience coming to Syracuse, the way that she does experience moving to Detroit um, are certainly influenced by her race, even while there are these other compounding um, factors. But I also hear a sense of coalition in this statement a sense of what is common in experiences that may be foundation for, for changing things as we move forward, for, for writing a different path. Um, I saw Ruthie had a comment. Do you mind reading that, Emma? I just can't access chat in the same way that I thought I could. Oh, you're on mute. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm so happy that everyone values the redlining information and wants to share it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, and you know, it's it, this is um, can be new information to adults even. So even as you're, yeah, I encourage you to share it with families. But um, I really believe in in engaging young people in, in this history. This history affects you at least as much as it affects us. Um, you will be here probably longer than we are. So thank you for your thoughts and feelings to this. Um, the next question is, what is gentrification? We're kind of turning. We're still talking about more or less the same things, but we'll be turning to those supplemental articles. But what is gentrification? It doesn't have to be a perfect definition. That's okay. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah. Is it when neighborhoods are for the rich only? Yeah, that is a, that is a good, um, yeah, it's a nice informal definition. Um, a little bit more formal of one that we would say is the process whereby the character of a poor urban area is changed by wealthier people moving in, improving housing and attracting new businesses, typically displacing current inhabitants in the process. Um, so that rich only would be the sense in which like an area that is poor, so often urban, 
um, may change. The wealthier people move in, and then as a result of that, people who used to live there can no longer afford to live there. Um, the process of pushing groups out and replacing them and their imprint on a community, that is correct. Um, yeah, all, all good definitions. We could talk about gentrification for a long time. Um, so now we're going to turn to this kind of question, which is like, how connected are poverty and quality of life? Um, how connected are these things really? So in order to assess this, I want to hold Detroit and Syracuse both in tension. So some similarities between these two cities as we're kind of asking this question of what if Fabiola had come here. Um, both are segregated due to redlining, urban renewal, and white flight. So these are things that occurred in pretty much all cities across the United States, um, but they certainly happened in Detroit and Syracuse. Both have suffered from the racist targeting of highway planning, so Detroit was similarly affected by the institution of a highway. And both are part of the Rust Belt, um, which is an area of the northeastern United States where we are that has suffered from economic decline, population loss, and urban decay. And these things occur due to deindustrialization and outsourcing. Um, so factories came in. Um, in in Detroit, there was it's called Motor City because Ford was there and Chrysler was there. Here in Syracuse, we had GM. But these were industries, large factories that you may have seen around town. And then they were outsourced, so it became cheaper to move things elsewhere, and those jobs disappeared, which also resulted in economic decline, population loss, and urban decay. Are there any others you can think of, either from reading the text or just ones that you know? Pittsburgh? Yeah, perfect. There are a lot that we could definitely slot into these. Yes, thank you. So. Great, so as Brooklyn, Bushwick, Brooklyn became gentrified, this process of a city kind of changing its identity, a number of its poorer residents moved to Detroit. And this actually helped inspire E.B. Zoboy to write American Street. So Bushwick, Brooklyn is where E.B. Zoboy is from. Um, and then she read this article that I offered you as a supplemental text. She mentions it in the credit of the book, but it's called Last Stop on the L Train, Detroit. And this is a little bit of a joke because the L train um, is a train in New York and its last stop was Brooklyn. But then so many people who used to live in Brooklyn moved to Detroit. And so now, um, whether you read that article or not, we'll just go through some quotes um, from this in a similar way that we did to the text and then give some space to respond. But the, the community and the quality of life that E.B. Zoboy heard in this article and saw reflected in Detroit is what led her to choose it as the site for the novel. Um, it's what brought her to the setting and really inspired the novel as she describes it. So here are some quotes of people describing Detroit. I rent billboard spaces where others don't see value. That is how I saw Detroit on my first visit four years ago. I saw great buildings, a deep and rich cultural history, and met amazing people. I want people to know that in Detroit you can afford to make art, be a chef, buy houses, start a business, do anything if you work hard. You can find your purpose in Detroit, which is nearly impossible to do these days in New York. Detroit's empty industrial spaces, community-based projects, experimental art scene, and innovative design opportunities beckon, despite the city's continuing challenges. Initially, I was attracted to the freedom of space and materials I found here, but what has surprised me is how Detroit has allowed me to mature. Owning my own place or starting a business was financially impossible in Brooklyn. I came here thinking I might help save Detroit, and instead it has saved me. This is one that I would echo for Syracuse, for myself personally. Because the city has been through so much, we are ahead of the nation on all the big conversations like race and class, but you have to settle in and get involved to succeed here. Detroit is culturally different, New York is predicated on competition. Toddlers fight seniors for subway seats. Detroit is all about collaboration. Newcomers need to realize Detroit residents have been working to find solutions to the city's problems for decades and should respectfully join Native's efforts rather than presume to have the answers. So what stands out to you from these quotes? What kind of quality of life is being described? And you can connect this to the text as E.B. Zoboy did. Um, or just more generally. Hey Jess, I yeah. was just, I mean, this is a little, this is not related to the book. I didn't end up reading it, but 
Um, it just makes me think about how there are so many human service organizations, like this is a resource rich community in Syracuse, yet many of the folks who are serving the Syracuse community are coming from other neighborhoods. And so that last quote kind of struck me um, and just thinking about like, not just um, like native to a city, but um, yeah, like t native to specific neighborhoods. Absolutely, yeah. So when we're thinking about intersections and multifacetedness, um, there's a sense in which like when we say someone from Syracuse, as the mayor was describing at the beginning in his comments, that can reflect some really disparate um, qualities of life, some really disparate lifestyles. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that, Hill. And certainly the kind of like when you're talking about natives, native to what? Um, and for me, my concern certainly being um, in these populations that have been most affected by histories of failure in the past, um, ways in which communities have been specifically targeted or failed or overlooked because of racism, um, because of classism. A place where you can be you and build a city up. I love this. Um, yeah, I am not native to Syracuse. Um, and this is how I feel about Syracuse as well, I should say. Um, I truly love it here because of this sense of space and freedom. And, and in this article, I heard a lot of that too. Syracuse and Detroit have more in common than I thought. I absolutely agree. Um, I didn't even, I wasn't even really thinking about Detroit very often um, until I finished this novel and was really moved by it, read E.B. Zoboy's note, and then I read this article and I was like, this is shocking. This sounds alarmingly like my own city. Um, you don't have to be from somewhere to make it better. Wow, yeah, that's powerful. Amen to that last comment, yeah. Um, and I appreciate that as someone who is non-native here. Um, but I think recognizing then that tension, um, these histories affect me, affect the people that I love on a daily basis. Um, but there's a sense in which not being from a place um, certainly affects your ability to see it. And that doesn't have to be a better or worse. I think there are things that I'm able to see about Syracuse that Fabiola is able to see about Detroit from not being out or from being outside of it. Um, sometimes that remove can give a different kind of perspective, but that different doesn't have to be better or worse. And I love this comment of you don't have to be from somewhere to make it better. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your contributions to this conversation. We're going to turn from Detroit now to another city, Atlanta, as we try to make better sense of our own city. We're engaging at these intersections, these crossroads, these points of conversation. And so this is a picture of East Lake Meadows. So this was a very poor neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you, Ruthie. I'm enjoying this tour with you all, enjoying being your tour guide, as it were. Um, so this is East Lake Meadows. This was in, this is, um, we're now going to look at some quotes from the other supplemental text that you may have read, but again, if not, no worries. I hope you're still able to participate as you all richly have been. So here is East Lake Meadows. And this next article is, has the shift to mixed income housing created a tale of two Atlantas? So East Lake Meadows was constructed in 1970. This was a 650 unit public housing complex that was four miles east of downtown Atlanta. By 1995, it was struggling in every measure. The employment rate of residents was only 14%. The crime rate there was 18 times the national average, and only 5% of fifth graders were meeting or exceeding the state math standards. So we can hear that there are some real tensions in this community. And then came the East Lake Foundation. And East Lake Meadows went from looking like it did to looking like this. And the villages at East Lake is then what it was renamed is photogenic and modern. It's set among some of Atlanta's most impressive amenities. Nearby, you can find an attractive supermarket, a YMCA, two preschools, a renovated golf course, and an educational crown jewel, the celebrated Charles R. Drew Charter School, Atlanta's first, which was built in 2000. And then in 2013, um, Ruthney lived not far from there. Thank you so much. Um, in 2013, 98% of third through eighth graders from East Lake met or exceeded the state standards in math. And so the 2013 violent crime rate was 95% lower than the 95's East Lake Meadows era number. So, but then we see that not everyone who used to live in East Lake Meadows currently enjoys the amenities of the villages at East Lake. So 400 families were spread throughout East Lake Meadows in 1995 but only 100 returned after the construction was completed of the new village in 1998. And those that did passed a screening test with work requirements 
And this process barred the formerly incarcerated, which we can imagine would be a real issue for a city or an area, a neighborhood of a city with high crime rates, um, whose friends and family would be affected by that. So if you look at it within what the goals of what poverty deconcentration were for these public housing transformation efforts, those goals really aren't being met. If you look at the goals for self-sufficiency, these residents are still poor. There's very little upward mobility going on. And another person says, if you think about how many people were relocated because of the demolition of Atlanta's traditional public housing, a very small percentage are benefiting from redevelopment. When they give you all these wonderful all these statistics about Eastlake and how wonderful it's doing, et cetera, I don't think it's not real, but I think it has to be looked at within the context of the broader outcomes and consequences of demolition. The closing of the public housing projects in Atlanta signified the end of one particular era, the era we think of Atlanta as the Black Mecca, the home of Black leadership and Black political power. So what stands out to you from these quotes? What kind of quality of life is being described here in this city? One where an external force came in to dictate what quality of life means. Mm, yeah, that's really powerful. Um, they looked at a community that was that was struggling, that was poor, that was that had certain tangible things. Um, yeah, this is great. Um, we have a question there as well. But yeah, that where an outside force came in and, and really kind of decided on what that quality of life would be that unfortunately did not include all people. Um, the neighborhood and the buildings may have gotten nicer, but only about one fourth of people who were there actually even got to benefit from it. And then I see a question that Ruthie offered as well. Mm, yeah, and on men, the quote about Black Mecca and um, people of color's experiences. Um, I saw that comment as well. I really love that too. And that's something that to connect to our own history, um, people articulated about the 15th Ward as well, a sense of closeness, a sense of tight knitness. Um, and there are actually many people who believe that in that process of redlining and urban renewal and the 81 viaduct, that part of that was an intentional targeting um, to try to break up black political power um, that white people we know in our in our nation have often been really scared of black people having power, um, which I feel is is resolutely unjust. I, I expect people around me to as well. And because of my practice of empathy, um, it's scary to not let people come back to a place they built. Yeah, that's amazing. Even if a community is struggling to to displace someone to contribute to that sense of homelessness. Um, is is a scary thing, but people love it Atlanta because it's so black. Why not let them decide how to change a city? That's a great question. Um, investing in people and, and trusting in people. From there, I hear you know kind of the inverse. This quote to me sounds reads more of the Detroit kind of side of things, where Fabiola is living and and navigating her own life. And um, it's not to say that it's not challenged. Um, but it's to say that that there's a organic kind of growth that we hear being inspired by by the last stop on the L train to the lady who used to live there. Are your friends still there? Yeah, absolutely. Are your friends still there? Are your family still there? What do you do if you don't have a criminal record, but your son or your child or your friend does? These are very real questions that when engaging the quality of life of a community are in, invaluable, essential that we must ask. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your participation in this question. Oh, hey, Josh, I oh. wanted to jump in um, please, to, the, please. to the, que the last question. Yeah. Actually, um, my friends are still there, sort of. Oh, um, sorry. I didn't are... realize this was about you. <laughs> um, oh, maybe it's not about me. No, I think it is. I believe you're reading it. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was in reference to the article, but I believe it is. And and I would like to know regardless, Ruth me. So <laughs> I was going to say my friends are sort of still there. Um, uh, a few of them did move because like, I guess as other businesses came there, it just got really expensive. Because like I because the because either you either you're like one of the families that screened to live in East Lake for like a certain amount of money or you're paying the regular price to live in a place that nice. So um, they, like, they, they're like you and me, like they have regular jobs. So they're not in a place where like they need the support to help make their payments. Mm 
but they don't make <laughs> they don't make enough to like make the out of the box price for living in a place like that. So some of them did move um, and they, they didn't live in projects, but they lived in areas close to there. So like other things around them got really expensive. So they did move. They're still in Atlanta though. They just moved to another part of Atlanta. So they're still okay. sort of there. <laughs> yeah, sort of there. Yeah. And again, we have this, we have this nuance, this in between, right? Like how do you, how much is displacement? What's the difference between moving down the road versus moving across the city versus moving to a different state? Um, and these things depend on a lot of factors, but thank you for sharing that personal experience, Ruthie. And I had no idea that you were from there when we were, when I was engaging with these. And is that gentrification? Um, that's a really good question. And I think it depends on who you ask. Um, in my opinion, speaking personally, yes, I would say that it is. Um, to take a community that may be struggling, but still has space for all of its members and to change that community in such a way where some members are no longer able to live there, um, simply, especially by nature because of their race or because of class, um, to me is, is gentrification. We could talk about degrees to these things. Similarly, binary categories may not be enough, um, but I, I do hear that, but that's the real question of this article, right? Um, has, the, has the shift to mixed income housing so the projects, as it's called, um, sometimes there's a lot of names for it, um, but East Lake Meadows originally, then shifting to the villages at East Lake. The idea of this mixed income housing is that people who were in East Lake Meadows are able to live alongside other people from mixed incomes. So you'd have neighbors who are richer or wealthier or different class brackets. And then the idea is that people who are poor there have the ability to live alongside. Um, but Yes, but then when only one fourth of them are allowed to return when they can't necessarily afford kind of as Ruthie is naming like out of the box like can't if you couldn't afford to live in that place of your own. Um, financial kind of empowerment, then how much connection do you have to that community, how much agency or autonomy do you have in relation to your neighbors. Um, these are real questions. We're inviting y'all into the to the real things. Um, the book talks about real things and so are we and yeah I agree Ruthie. it is great to hear. Um, from younger folks about these things. So another question would be, what is the difference between eliminating poverty and elevating the quality of life in a city? We've done a lot of, we've looked at a lot of different things, kind of read some different articles. You've got the text to lean on. What do you think is the difference between eliminating poverty and elevating the quality of life in a city? And I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. <laughs> Um, I think that eliminating poverty is probably different from elevating the quality of the quality of life because through when you eliminate it, you're probably making active changes to like the systems that keep poverty in place and stuff. While elevating the quality of life is just like putting more Wegmans in areas. I don't know, you know. Sure. So eliminating poverty sounds more to you like it rings of a structural kind of transformation versus elevating the quality of life. You, um, you're attributing that to like having another Wegmans. I, I love this. Um, would you say that that is true? If you feel comfortable kind of applying it to your own experience, I would love to hear from you about that. Would you say that having a Wegmans um, successfully elevates the quality of your life? Um, um, or that that's just what people talk about more whenever they, I would just yeah. love to know more. Yeah. I feel like, um, just kind of like when I say like getting new Wegmans, when they say elevating, elevating the quality of life, I just think of making neighborhoods prettier, making prettier houses, prettier parks, but mm. not really creating opportunities for people to get out of that poverty that they're living in, you know? Yeah. So for me, elevating really... the quality is just making things, putting a little glitter on stuff, you know? Mm, that's really fascinating. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Anmin. Um, it's very interesting in relation to what our theme is and, and what we're trying to go at. Um, it's also fascinating because I would say that in general, eliminating poverty is more of a phrase that's attached to the kind of East Lake transformation that we're seeing. Um, but it sounds like to you to take this seriously, to say eliminating poverty, um, I hear you to be saying like actually eliminating the structural barriers to people being poor in the first place that that's a little bit more of a comprehensive thing. Whereas this concern with elevating the quality of life, as you named, like throwing some glitter on it. I love that. Yeah, just just giving it a fresh coat of paint and, and then not paying attention to it further. I think that's a very real tension. Thank you so much for sharing. 
Now here, elevating the quality of life in a community has a direct effect on poverty in said community. I think that's probably true, yeah. Um, if you enrich people and invite people into a richer quality of life, um, then it's going to affect poverty, perhaps positively or negatively. And as we've named, different people want different things out of quality of life, which can be kind of complicated. But I think taking seriously what a community is asking for on its own terms and prioritizing, you know, again, what that, um, what the Atlanta article was, or what the Detroit article was referring to about taking natives' concerns seriously. And that if you're trying to help improve a community, whether by eliminating poverty or quality of life, um, really assessing what the effect of those actions will be on that community. And then there is more to life than poverty. Can I see me and my neighborhood and it be safe and nice? Wow, what a great question. Um, and that as an indicator of quality of life, I think is really rich. Um, there is more to life than poverty. And I think as we see in Fabiola's case, um, this is perfect. We'll segue right actually into this. Um, I think this speaks to what I would hope that, what, what I would feel um, in this quality of life conversation, which is that what and who we value reveals a great deal about our collective quality of life. And our quality of life is always inherently collective in some measure. We stand at these intersections with one another in this conversation here today in a city and in different neighborhoods that that what happens over there doesn't stay nicely over there, that it that it affects our neighborhood. And, and this question of can I can I be me and see me in my neighborhood? Um, to, to another point that one of you made so astutely, um, I also believe that it is untrue to assume that just because someone is poor, that they have a poor quality of life. Um, that's oftentimes we speak about people being poor or being in poverty, and this becomes the single story for that individual, for that community. Um, but simply because someone is poor, just as we see with Fabiola, that doesn't mean that they don't need clean water or clean air or healthy food. But it also doesn't mean that just because they are poor that they have a poor quality of life. We are more than one thing. I grew up technically poor and had an amazing, fun, and safe childhood, Ruthie. Yes, I would identify the same, very working class, and I'm very thankful for the ways in which I can stretch a dollar and think creatively about things that are that are non-financial to pass the time, and, and I'm also here. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I would also say that it is untrue to assume that eliminating poverty is the same as enriching quality of life. And to On Min's point, perhaps we could inverse these. It is also untrue to assume that enriching the quality of life is the same as eliminating poverty. Um, these things are not interchangeable, but oftentimes when we're making, when we think about these, when these things get picked up in conversation, um, I do believe that poverty often becomes a justification to kind of take away people's autonomy, to take away their agency, becomes an indication that they don't know what's best for themselves, that, that, they're, that they don't, um, that they need outside assistance. And they may need assistance, um, but does that assistance come kind of as Emma was naming from an outside organization from a top down, or does it really work to empower the very specific needs of that community? And so I would like to encourage you beyond today to really notice, pay attention, listen well. Um, when people describe a community as only one thing, poor or criminal or underperforming, because there's probably more intersections that are happening there um, than we might first see. And these words can become weapons or can become flattening for people. I think the text really invites us into a richer understanding than that. And again, consider those intersections. We are always at a crossroads. Every moment of every day, every breath we take is influenced by the lives and the decisions of people who come far before us and will influence the people after us um, as we navigate our own kind of crossroads and intersections. So here I just want to catch us up to speed on where we are. Purpose-built communities as we're talking about Syracuse and Atlanta and Detroit. Um, the East Lake Foundation spawned an organization called Purpose-Built Communities. Um, which is working to redesign the East Adams neighborhood here in Syracuse. Um, and it is run by these three men, Warren Buffett, Tom Cousins, and Julian Robertson Jr. So the East Lake relationship applies very directly to Syracuse because yes, the success, um, as people have called it, of the East Lake, the villages at East Lake, um, is working with purpose-built communities um, to assess our future, the future of your and my city here in Syracuse. And so um, I want to encourage or invite you to say, yes, I'm here with Planned Parenthood. Um, I care very passionately about these things, these histories of redlining and the future of how the mistakes and failures of those in the past are influencing our futures. 
Um, we'll be facilitating a youth summer program at Planned Parenthood in partnership with the Urban Jobs Task Force, which I included the website there. Um, I really encourage y'all to, to go check out the Urban Jobs Task Force if what um, we spoke about here today spoke to you in any way. The Urban Jobs Task Force is an organization that is trying to get jobs for people in Census Tract 42. So people who are the poorest and often and, and black residents in the, in the city um, to really try to reverse these histories of redlining and to, to get economic um, opportunities and support for communities that have been failed by our by our past legacies. So we're really, really excited and proud to be partnering with them with Planned Parenthood. I was hoping to invite some of you to participate in the youth summer program. Unfortunately, our high school age positions are filled. However, um, I would like to say that your voice still matters. These are ongoing conversations. These histories that we explored today are not gone. They're not past. I hope you can hear and see that these are living with us today. These affect our lives today and you will shape the future of our city. Um, I love working with young people. Um, I still consider myself to be pretty young, um, but as I named, this will be your city and whether or not you are represented by it, whether or not you see yourself in it, um, will, will be determined by the actions um, that we make together and that you can step into today. So even though our summer program is full in terms of specific participants, I still would love to give you um, our email address, which is SYR Education, S-Y-R Education at ppcwny.org. We will probably be having um, volunteer opportunities throughout the summer. So if you would like to get to know people who are going to be studying these things really richly for eight weeks, um, getting to work with them or partnering with us in the future, um, these are conversations and and missions and visions of dreams that I and my team and the people around me, I'm trying to invite them into. So I encourage you, yes, this is, event is being recorded. So share it with your family, share it with your friends, um, talk to other people about what you've learned, um, about what you're reading at any given time. Um, and if you would like to partner with us in any capacity or have any questions about sexual and reproductive wellness, um, just want someone to talk to, um, then we are here for you. So you can reach out. Um, via email and I can help get you connected into what you can do to help continue to to make your voice and your vision matter um, to shape this city to be the city that we want it to be and one that represents all of us. Um, and with that. Um, yeah, we can conclude with this kind of open question if you all would like um, we just crossed, I think, a formal hour, um, but if you would like to share, then I would love to hear what future do you hope for in Syracuse. What kind of quality of life do you want to see. Again, you can share this in Menti or come off mute. If you need to leave, then that's okay too. It's always okay. <laughs> I want to see more businesses on side streets. I love it. Small businesses are one of the most inspiring things that happened um, when I moved to Syracuse. The other places that I've lived are um, Dallas, um, Dallas, Texas and Nashville, which are both booming cities. They're growing in every sense, um, but there are very, very, very few small businesses. Small businesses really cannot survive um, in cities as people described in New York, kind of when talking about Bushwick versus Detroit. Um, so I would also love to see more businesses on side streets, little, little corners tucked away, people making a living based off their craft or based off small, um, small kind of projects, local businesses. Um, I, I agree. I share your vision and thank you. <laughs> More roads getting fixed. <laughs> Great. Yeah, um, <laughs> that, that one's difficult. I know I'm in Syracuse because the weather is so wild. I might even take this a step further and, you know, I'm, I'm a crunchy environmentalist out here. I would love to see a future without cars. Um, with more foot traffic, with more bicycles, with things connected, good and safe future and successful goals. That's great. Yeah. And, and good being determined again. Yeah, those the complexity of those things. Good being determined by the collective needs of the community, um, that safe future and, and people being able to see their goals um, come true. I, I hear again the echoes of that Detroit article. Yeah. Um, what is possible in a city? Well, thank you so, so much um, for your time and for your contribution. Um, you are all so amazing. I love, I love speaking with all of you today. Um, the text was really rich and informative to me, but um, to hear from, to hear from all of you sharing a city, sharing a space with me, um, sharing these questions and this heaviness, um, I really cannot thank you enough. 
Yes, and thank you, Anman. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Um, you got it, Ruthie. <laughs> But yes, please get in touch if you would like to. Um, I believe, how am I going to stop stop sharing? There it is. Um, yes, and I'm so, so thankful for all of you for sharing, for sharing your time and your thoughts and your heart with me and, and our crew today. So yeah, thanks, Esra. You're most welcome. It was my Thank pleasure. you so much, Joss. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was Emma. <laughs> You're so welcome, Emma. <laughs> all right, I had to bounce. bounce You're so good. Mind. Well, that's it for us today. That was that was really good. I'm, not that I'm surprised, but that was <laughs> really, really good. Um, got me thinking, got the juices flowing. And um, I would love to to get some of the slides with like the responses from everyone. Um, yeah. Especially when you ask questions like, you know, what what would make the city better and what people want to see from the city. Mm -hmm. And I want to think about how we can use that because, I mean, you all made the time to tell us, so I want to make sure we honor your opinions. But everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have not gotten a media release to Emma, her email is eSpector. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat in hopes that I don't misspell it or butcher it because sometimes I do that. <laughs> make sure you send it to her. Um, otherwise, I hope you log off. You have a wonderful restful evening and rest of the week and summer. And as you kind of walk around the city and see, see it with like a different lens and look at it with different eyes, do not hesitate to say, let us know how you feel, um, what you see, what you notice, ask questions. You can ask questions at mayor at seargov.net. Um, something that the mayor always says when he goes to uh, the high school graduations because I go with them. I used to teach, so like I just I play a game every year where I'm like, okay, do I see any of my old students crossing the stage? So like I'm almost out of students to be saying that with. But um, yeah, he always says, um, all the adults in this room have your back, and I have your back. And I think the same goes for everyone on this call. So if you ever have a question, you ever want to participate in something, you ever just want to raise your hand and be like, hey, I want to know, or why don't we try this, or I don't like what just happened, or I have an idea, you shoot it to mayor at seargov.net. There's a human being on the other side of the email. You won't get a robot. There's a human being on the other side of the email. More than half of the time that human being is Emma, <laughs> but there's a team of human <laughs> beings on that email. Um, just making sure that, again, we respect and honor your input. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. So lovely seeing you all. Don't Bye. be strangers. Bye, thanks everyone. <laughs> Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Emma and the PP team. Emma, hang around. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Joss. That was absolutely